oh, for about 15 years now. Yeah, so you like it. yeah almost 20. Yeah, almost 20. <laughs> Since 2001. And uh, so he has a lot of open knowledge about uh, water in the valley. And uh, so he was generous enough to come over and give us a talk on fire and water and how uh, some people think, and he thinks, uh, these recent fires are going to affect our water supply. Important question. So I'd like you to give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Conrad. Thanks, Greg. So I'd like to uh, thank the Washington Council for uh, hosting this event. This is great to be able to get people together and talk about water. I love to talk about water, and I appreciate everybody turning out for for this talk. Um, so I'll talk about how wildfires affect stream flow in general, and then specifically here in the valley. Uh, I think it's important to start any talk about wildfire uh, with a couple of acknowledgements. Uh, first, I just like to acknowledge that you know people uh, have lost loved ones, animals, and property in wildfire, and so. My sympathy kind of goes out to those folks. And I'd also like to acknowledge the wildland firefighters who uh, protect our loved ones and animals and property. And uh, they really are, you know, heroes in my mind. So just a quick overview of the talk. There will be three things that I want to talk about. One, about how wildfire has multiple effects on the hydrologic cycle. And I'll go through that. Uh, and then I'll talk about some lessons about uh, how stream flow has responded to past wildfires. And then uh, talk a little bit about expectations for stream flow responses to recent and future <laughs> wildfires. Um, I don't have a lot of slides, and so I'll spend time kind of going through each slide in as much detail um, as seems appropriate. Uh, folks should ask questions, though, as I go along. I'm happy to kind of entertain questions and uh, have discussion kind of during, during the talk. So don't, uh, don't feel like you have to wait till the end of the talk to ask a question or even get a comment. So um, we're going to start with stream flow and the hydrologic cycle. And um, I'm not going to put up a hydrologic cycle here because I'm sure most folks are seeing one or too many. Um, but the important point here is that wildfire affects uh, stream flow at multiple points in the hydrologic cycle. And so it's not a simple relationship to say, oh, there's a wildfire, here's what's going to happen. Because there are uh, effects at different points in the hydrologic cycle that interact and then kind of create the, the uh, effects that we see. The four big ones that I think we should probably focus on, at least initially, are listed over here. So number one, we have less interception. So interception is the part of the hydrologic cycle where you have rain or snow that falls from the sky and it hits vegetation. And we say, like, just like football, the vegetation intercepts that rain or intercepts that snow. You can see that during the winter when you look at a forest uh, and you notice there's like snow on the trees. So those trees have intercepted that snow. Um, we, after wildfire, there's less interception. And so the rain and the snow doesn't hit the tree. It just falls right onto the ground. Um, so that's really important. Um, that's probably uh, one of the biggest effects, direct effects of wildfire that then has consequences for stream flow because that snow or rain that would have hung up on the trees, um, a lot of that would just evaporate back up. Uh, and that process doesn't happen after wildfire. So you have more accumulation of snowpack, you have more rain um, getting down to the ground. So first, that's the first um, part of the hydro hydrologic cycle where we have an impact. Second part is infiltration. So infiltration is the process where uh, rain or snow, that snow that's melted um, on the ground, uh, goes soaks into the ground. We call that um, infiltration. And infiltration's a tricky one. There can be either more or less infiltration after wildfire. 
You can get more infiltration because we don't have the canopy, the trees intercepting the snow and the rain. So we have more water hitting the ground, so more water can soak in. But there's also an effect of wildfire where you have vegetation. It's not as common in forests. It's more what you see it more in um, shrublands where the shrubs have a lot of oils in their leaves. The wildfire will burn and those oils will volatilize, they'll evaporate, and then they condense on the soil because the soil's cold. And that creates a layer of these oils that essentially make the soil, uh, it resists then wetting. And so then you get less infiltration. Uh, so um, that's why we can kind of, you know, we don't really know unless we go out and, and look uh, whether or not there's more or less infiltration after a wildfire. You can get either either of those effects. Is, yeah. it, is that effect persistent over years, or is that a one-year hit after the You know, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I haven't really studied kind of the, that um, process where you have um, the, the uh, hydrophobic soils. Um, my sense is that it could persist, but... Yeah, it's probably not. I mean, all of these effects are going to kind of diminish over time, and and I'll talk about that with forests in particular. But so I'm not, I'm not sure about the the soils. Imagine it depends a lot on if you're in an arid area, then it could probably persist longer. If you get a lot of rain, that's going to eventually wash that stuff out. Is there another effect where the soil could kind of glassify due to the heat? It, it, it probably in places. I don't know that you would get extensive um, uh, areas where you know where you kind of like sheets of impermeable soil. Um, I haven't I haven't heard of, of that. So, is this the same as uh, hydrophobic soil? I've heard that term. Yes, exactly. So hydrophobic. Okay. Yeah, if I can just explain. So, so hydro is water, and then phobic is you know uh, uh, it repels water essentially. Right. Yeah. So it's only it's only uh, caused by uh, oils in shrubby plants, and not uh, just a change in the soil chemistry itself. That's my understanding. Usually, soils. I mean, if soils that had a lot of organic matter, I guess potentially could. But I think a lot of that organic um, carbon is just going to combust. And so you actually have to have um, uh, organic compounds that are fairly large that when they, um, when they, when, when you do have a wildfire, they don't just burn up. They actually still, they volatilize, they evaporate, but then they recondense on the soil. Um, so my understanding is that most of that comes from shrubs, and in particular shrubs like um, ceanothus, things that are super, um, uh, you know, very kind of tough and um, have a lot of have a lot of oils in it. Okay. Yeah, like snowberry uh, or um, service berry aren't going to do that. Okay, so we have less interception of the for by the forest canopy. Infiltration could be more or less, probably more because we have more uh, water getting onto the ground. Um, next thing is uh, transpiration. So transpiration is the process where vegetation takes up soil water and then it goes out through the leaves and stems. And so uh, it's like evaporation, only it's passing through the vegetation. Um, and so we say that vegetation transpires that water. So if we take the vegetation away, we're going to get less transpiration. Uh, so this is important just from the, if you look at a water budget for uh, a basin like the Met House, um, you know, maybe a third to a half of the water is actually getting uh, transpired or evaporated. Um, and so having less transpiration can make a really big deal in the water budget. Uh, on that note, it's important also to say, okay, there's less transpiration, there could be more evaporation. So evaporation is the same process, but it, it's water going up into the atmosphere, but it doesn't go through vegetation. So ponds evaporate water, uh, wet soils evaporate water. 
So if you have, if you have, if you remove the vegetation, your soils are going to be wetter. They're going to probably evaporate. There's going to be more water evaporating from the soils. So you're going to have less transpiration, but you're also going to probably have a little more evaporation. So it's not just um, you can't just say, oh, less transpiration and all that water that is showing up is stream flow. There's going to be kind of um, some trade-off there. Um, and that kind of stuff, it's hard to quantify unless you get to a really specific case and say, okay, a south-facing slope is going to be different than a north-facing slope, and it's going to depend a lot on the vegetation, it's going to depend a lot on the water year as well, whether it's a wet year or a dry year. Um, finally, a uh, soil moisture. So we have um, more water getting to the soil, more water getting into the soil. Uh, vegetation is pulling less water out of the soil, so we have more soil moisture. Um, so those are kind of the four big direct, um, or the four big impacts of wildfire that then lead us to, okay, how, how, what's going to happen to stream flow? And you can see that most of these are going to increase stream flow. Um, and indeed, that's what we see. But the effects really, they vary by season, and they vary between wet and dry years. A lot of these fact, effects aren't so important in wet years because soils would be saturated whether or not they have vegetation. And so um, uh, in a wet year, the trees have intercepted all the water that they can intercept. And so you're getting a lot of water that's still getting down to the soil. So um, in wet years and in wet climates, you don't see those effects. In really dry years and really dry climates, you also might not have, uh, see the effects as much. So there's really kind of sensitive basins are going to be uh, more what we call mesic. They're going to be between kind of wet and dry. And it's going to be those probably more normal to drier years where we really do see the effects. Uh, and then like, likewise, the effects are going to vary by season. So um, we're going to see more snow accumulation, and that's going to mean more snow melt, so a lot more water in the spring um, and early summer. Um, we might not see effects as much in the winter when things are cold and there's not a lot of um, water moving out into the streams. Um, I'll just um, highlight these two pictures. This picture here is from uh, Driveway Butte, and I forget what year the, there was a fire up there. I want to say it was around 2005 or six. Oh four, I think. Oh four, okay. I think that was the needles fire. Okay, yeah, the needles fire. And so this was a few years after that, and I didn't do like a, a controlled study up there, but I did hike up there, and I noticed all these little creeks that were running in the middle of summer. And you can see how green it was. This was, again, this is the middle of summer. And so there was a lot more soil moisture up there. And that water was coming up. And you'd see these little streams that you'd expect to be dry at that point in the summer were still flowing. Um, and then this other picture here, this is our the USGS stream gauge on Andrews Creek. Uh, it's about four or five miles in, I believe. And um, this is a, a shot of it in the winter. And we'll talk more about the Andrews Creek. So is it possible to quantify how much water reaches the streams if you lose so much uh, timber cover? We, I'll talk about that for Andrews Creek, because that's probably the best place where we can do that. But again, as I mentioned before, the problem with trying to quantify it is uh, a stationary process, right? So like. Immediately after the fire, you expect to see big effects, and then those effects diminish over time. You expect to see bigger effects in certain years, kind of dryish years. And so now it's the combination of like, well, was it a wet year or a dry year, and how many years after the fire? Uh, what do you compare that to? Um, so it's not a straightforward answer, but I'll, I'll show some stuff there. Um, so direct effects for wildfire, we have loss of vegetation and changes uh, to the soil, as, um, as I uh, discussed before. So that's kind of really the starting point uh, for where we start to see hydrologic effects, right? These trees are not going to be transpiring any water, they're not going to be intercepting much water at all. You can see the soil structure. Um, this isn't a hydrophobic soil, in fact, um, this is a, a, a root that burned out. You can see now there's these, these big pores that's going to easily kind of 
uh, absorb a lot of water um, and snow. So the, um, the hydraulic consequences from wildfire are significant, but they're transient. So they are going to diminish over time. We expect right after the fire, um, you know, the first year or two, we're going to see a lot of effects. But then as um, vegetation comes back, we start to see recovery. So the immediate things that we, uh, immediate hydrologic consequences that we see are debris flows during intense um, rain on unvegetated slope. And this is a um, photograph from Andrews Creek, uh, right, the, I think it was the, the autumn or late summer after the Farwell fire, there was a really intense thunderstorm right over Little Andrews Creek that set off a bunch of debris flows. And you kind of see this is the outline of the debris flow. This is all that um, mud that came down, trails right here. This is a, a backpack just for scale. Um, so this is, this is common, um, what we'd expect, because uh, if we go back to this landscape, you uh, drop a bunch of rain on it, there's nothing holding onto that soil, the soil is going to mix with the rain, and you're going to get uh, debris flows coming down. Uh, okay, so that's kind of during intense rain, we expect to see that. Uh, in the winter, we expect to see increased snow accumulation, and then that shows up with um, bigger snow packs in the spring and greater snow soil moisture during the growing season. And then, as a consequence, we see increased runoff and stream flow. Then, um, those effects you know, don't persist forever. So you see them couple years after uh, fire, maybe up to a decade. But as forests and then shrubs step, um, as the plants come back and grow, uh, you, the soil gets revegetated and those hydrologic effects diminish over time. And in forests, we typically see that on the kind of a scale of about a decade, where after, after a decade, it becomes hard to really detect the effects. Um, so we'll come back and talk more about kind of quantifying effects, um, but we're going to start that discussion with, with, uh, with quantifying effects using the actual observed stream flow from Andrews Creek, but we're going to start the discussion looking at uh, the simulated effects of wildfire. So USGS uh, constructed a watershed model, uh, in, it was published in 2003, that simulates uh, runoff from rain and snow melt to rivers and large streams in the basin. And you can see the blue lines basically represent what the model, what, where the model was simulating stream flow. And the model takes a grid of precipitation and other um, solar radiation and uh, temperature, a bunch of other factors, and then it calculates how much snow or runoff is being um, is uh, present in kind of little grid cells over this entire basin. And then um, that water kind of gets into the stream channel network and works its way down the stream. So um, we constructed that watershed model and then um, we took that model and we said, okay, can we actually try to um, get the model to simulate what um, wildfire, what the, what the hydro hydrologic effects of wildfire would be. Uh, we didn't have a wildfire that we could actually calibrate the model to, but there's some parameters in the model, so things like um, soil um, parameters and vegetation that we said, okay, well, if there was a wildfire, here's what we'd expect that parameter value to be. And we changed the parameters and then ran the model um, using those values to see what the model would say, um, uh, how would that affect water availability during the year. We did a couple of different um, scenarios, uh, or, or we, um, we changed the parameters in a number of different um, uh, stream basins. So we 
took Andrews Creek here, we changed the parameters there, we changed the parameters in Little Bridge Creek, which is a tributary to the twist, and Buttermilk Creek, which is another tributary to the twist. And then there were some other places where we did it as well, but I'll talk about the results for those um, particular basins. Um, so this is a hydrograph for the Twist River, and the model, I can't recall exactly how many years we ran the model, for, the simulation for, I want to say uh, 20 years of precipitation records. And then what we did is we went through and took the um, mean daily discharge for each day of the year, and that's what this hydrograph is, sh is showing. So it's not a uh, hydrograph, the stream flow, for any particular year. It's the mean of a couple decades um, of this simulation. So you get a general sense of, of what's going on. Um, so this is for the Twist River, near Twist. Uh, the, the, um, the hydrograph goes from October uh, through to December. And then um, this is 1 CFS, 10 CFS, 100 CFS, 1,000 CFS. The baseline is, to, is this blue line here. You can only see it in places because the other lines kind of plot over it. So wherever that you can't see that blue line, it means some of these other scenarios are, are no different than what the baseline is. So the baseline is no change. That's kind of what we'd expect without any effects. We actually ran um, a number of different scenario, water management scenarios. So this was not just a wildfire study. We were looking at um, other, uh, some other uh, water management scenarios. Um, so that's why we have a number of different lines here. But the um, red uh, line, number five, is the wildfire scenario. And really, it's more of a, a forest cover scenario, where the forest cover has been removed. Um, um, so. Um, that might be a good way to, to think about it. So what you can see is that the model is predicting increased stream flow uh, in the winter and spring, uh, going up kind of into uh, during the snow melt period. So this red line, you can see how it plots above all the other scenarios, including this blue baseline. So the model is saying, OK, you're going to get more stream flow during uh, the snow melt period. But then the rest of the year, you can see the red and the blue really just kind of match each other until you get into this uh, uh, fall period when we start to see some rain effects. Um, and so this is pretty um, accurate, or not necessarily accurate, but, but at least qualitatively, that's what we expect to see more stream flow here. But um, what, we, what we do see is we actually see increased low flows in response to wildfire, and the model was not predicting that. So that, um, I think that's important because it does kind of show the limits to what these models can do, and that's where you really do need to have um, information, um, in this case about wildfire or about uh, forest management and stream flow responses to it, so you can calibrate the model to get it to you know, show the right thing. So um, the results from this model um, for uh, Andrews Creek and then for the Twist River are pretty interesting to, to look at. So we have wet years, normal years, dry years, and then the scenarios were different for Andrews and for the Twist. So for the Twist, like I mentioned, it was just Little Bridge and Buttermilk Creeks where we changed the parameters. So basically we kind of say, OK, those basins um, all the forest burned, or all the forest was removed. And that's about 24% of the basin. And then for Andrews Creek, we did the entire basin in there. And so that's 100%. So um, this is an important point, is that when we start talking about effects of, of wildfire on stream flow, we really have to understand how much of the basin burned, how intense did it burn, how, you know, how much of the vegetation really was, was burned off. Um, and you know any kind of basin, there's going to be variation in where the trees are. And so if the forest isn't kind of, um, uh, the main part of the 
course, isn't burned off, you're not going to expect to see the uh, same amount of effects. So, um, for Andrews Creek, what we see is the, these, these values in this table are for, for the upper table are for a whole year. We see about 36% increase in the amount of stream flow, the amount of runoff from the basin in a wet year, and almost 100% increase in a dry year. Uh, that's what the model is, is uh, predicting, would be is predicting. And normal year, halfway between, so about a 50% increase. Uh, for the Twist River, where in the scenario only about a quarter of the basin burned, we see a um, you know, smaller increase and much less of an effect um, on the wet, normal, dry year. Um, I don't know exactly why that uh, works out that way. It may be because of where those basins are, it, well, the, the tributaries that we uh, uh, change the parameters or lower down the basin. That might be the effect. Um, don't don't really. Know. But uh, but you can see much smaller uh, increases, uh, less than twenty percent of uh, increase in stream flows with models. The second table is structured the same way. So we have Andrews, we have Twist, but here the values are for just for September. So we have a wet September, a normal September, and a dry September. And generally, what the model is saying, oh, you're not going to see much of a change. Uh, in Andrews, we saw up to a 5% increase in uh, dry stuff. Uh, that's, that's kind of what the model is saying. So um, what's interesting is after we did this, um, uh, Andrews Creek burned. And, and we have a stream gauge there. And the stream gauge has been operating since 1968. So we actually have a great um, kind of uh, data set to compare to this and say, okay, is this really what we see? Um, as I mentioned before, the water year annual runoff uh, values are kind of in the ballpark, but the model is not really doing a good job on what's happening with base flow. And that's where I think it's really important to actually go to a, 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 a gauge that, we, that we've been operating and look to see what the results are. So there have been a number of fires in the valley, uh, recent fires in the valley. So I, I'll, I'll actually back up here. A lot of our US, US stream gauges um, were started uh, after 1990. And so we don't have a super long record at most of the gauges. Uh, the gauge of Pateros has been around the, most of the 20th century. Um, so that's an exception. Uh, but. Uh, most of the other gauges are, are fairly recent. And so we can't really use those to, uh, we don't have a good kind of uh, pre-fire record for any old fires. But we can look at some recent fires and maybe get an idea of what's going on. So I just pulled out three recent fires, Farwell in 2003, Tripod in 2006, Carlton in uh, 2014. Uh, and the reason that we're going to focus on the Farwell fire is that even though it was pretty small, it did really burn the entire Andrews Creek Basin, or nearly the entire basin. And the intensity was um, uh, pretty high, so it wasn't a kind of a patchy fire. Basically, that fire burned, you can see, this is our gauge, you can see that fire burned off you know, most of the forest. Um, the tripod fire, 2006, there are potentially impacts to the Chihuahua, but it probably didn't affect as much of the area as a, as a proportion. And, um, and so then trying to find that signal becomes trickier. And then um, Carlton uh, fire was very large, but we really didn't, don't have any stream gauging in that area other than uh, the main center of the Mahao at um, Terrace. So that's the reason why I'll really focus on the Farwell Fire uh, 2003 and Andrews Creek phase. So, yeah. Uh, maybe this isn't the time to bring this no, in. No. But one other factor that uh, is very observable from where I live, uh, close to a wildfire last time of the Carl's Fire, is the steepness of the terrain. Um, so, 
it, does that factor in to any of the other uh, ram, you know, follow through of the fire? Uh, Definitely for the like the, uh, the debris flows and for uh, responses to kind of very intense rainfall. So uh, we'll see kind of flash floods in that type of a terrain. Uh, it's much more pronounced. Yeah. Um, my expectation is that in steep terrain, you might not see as much of the just the general increase in stream flow because of more water getting into the ground. Because a lot of the water just runs off. But uh, that, yeah, it would have to be very steep and you know, thin, thin soils, shallow soils. Okay, so this is a, a hydrograph of monthly stream flow going back to 1968 uh, for Andrews Creek. Um, and uh, it's in uh, cubic meters per second, so if you want to convert to cubic feet per second, you just have to multiply those by 35. So the bottom dash line would be uh, 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 33 and a half CFS, and this would be 35 uh, CFS. Uh, and first of all, I hope you kind of appreciate that like every year we see a lot of variability in the slide grid, right? So the peaks kind of can be up or down, depending on if it's a wet or dry year. The low flows could be up or down, again, depending on if it's a dry year. You see periods of like sustained kind of elevated base flows. Um, but you get a general sense of how the creek, um, uh, stream flow of the creek varies monthly over time. And then this box right here shows us the post fire months. And you can see the peaks, nah. Uh, these are not instantaneous peaks, so these are not the kind of flash floods, which or, or the highest flow of the year, which probably did increase in response to this fire. But um, at a monthly, for, for the months of June and uh, May, they gone up months, we're not seeing huge increases. But you will notice that the low flows are uh, kind of consistently higher post fire. And especially after the first couple of years, um, quite high here. Uh, and that effect really hasn't kind of gone away. Uh, and so that's what the, that model is kind of missing, is are those, that effect on low flows. And if we want to quantify that effect, I don't know, I'd say maybe this is a log scale. So each, so going from here to here represents it doubling of base flow, so our low flows. So if our low flows are generally about 0.1 cubic meters per second um, per month, in a month, um, you're going up to about 0.2. So we can really zoom in on those values. So if we just look at these what we call base flow part of the hydrograph. So that's this part of the hydrograph right in here, these low flows um, that are typically going to be you know, August, September, um, October, through potentially through January, February before snow starts melting. We just look at stream flows, um, those stream flows, and um, and calculate a median value for each year, we can see that they were hovering right around 0.1 cubic meters per second prior to the wildfire. And then after the wildfire, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, they really jump up, and they're really right around about 0.2. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like that's an important time on for low flows. Yeah, yeah. Now, the problem with this is like we haven't really accounted for the year-to-year -year variation in snowpack and rainfall. And so I can kind of wave my hands a little bit and say, okay, base flow, it doubled. But we really need to know better 
what's the, the difference in pre precipitation between those periods? They're long enough that there's probably not a huge difference, but there could be a small difference that's contributing to this. So it may be that this period generally was wetter than this period, and that's part of the effect that we're seeing. So um, I don't have, you know, I don't have a plot that's going to kind of pull out the effects of precipitation because it's not a straightforward analysis. But um, but I think even if we did account for, for precipitation, um, we would still see an effect about the same strength. Okay, so um, I'm going to actually kind of shift to a, a related but slightly different topic. So I might just pause here if anybody has any questions um, just about what we've covered so far. Oops. Pretty clear about no confusion. Good. Oh one, yeah. One question. Yeah. Um, what about the timing of your peaks? Uh, did you observe any shift to the right or left in the when the high flows occurred, date wise, and base flows? Um, I have not looked at that, and that's a that's a a tough question. I guess you'd expect to see. I mean, we saw saw from the model. That we that there's likely to be kind of increased stream flow throughout the snowmelt period, and the peak is probably going to come a little bit earlier, but it depends a lot on the spring. You know, was it was it really hot May or not? And then we typically see that just um, in years with bigger snow pack, we expect to see a later peak, and so there's also that effect that you. Have, we have to account for as well. Um, but I think it would be safe to say we, we would expect to see more water coming off in the spring. We're not going to be expecting to see like, oh yeah, there's a bunch of water in July um, as a result. Um, okay. So um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about changes in riverbed elevation, and this might be kind of a, a nice um, uh, kind of um, foreshadowing of the stuff that uh, Jennifer Fauci will be talking about with sediment. Uh, when we um, measure stream flow uh, at a site in a river, what we're really doing is we're really measuring the, the water surface elevation of the river. Continuously, we have an instrument that um, typically is measuring the pressure of the water, and that tells us what the water level in the river is. And that's the that's the thing that we are measuring continuously. Right now, there's a gauge in the Twist River that's every 15 minutes. It's taking a reading of the water level in the river. Uh, we go out. Uh, Occasionally, probably six to ten times a year, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the site, and actually measure stream flow. So we have a, a meter that measures the velocity of the water in the stream. And so we measure its width, and we measure its depth, and we measure its velocity going through that section. And then that, we multiply those three things together, and we get the flow rate. We get the volume of water that's passing per time through kind of a section of the, of the river. So we make that stream flow measurement, and then we know what the water level is in the, in the river at, at, at that same time. And then we can create a curve like this. And this, this is actually the stage discharge curve for the Twist River. These little dots represent the measurements that we've made of stream flow, so from zero up to uh, about 600 CFS, and then river stage varied between, gosh, this is what, 0.1 foot up to about three feet. And so we have a relationship now between stream flow and stage. And so what that means is that nobody has to be out in the Twist River right now <coughs> measuring stream flow. As long as we know what the river stage is, we can then use this curve to say, oh, the river stage was a foot and a half, and so stream flow was about, I don't know, 75 CFS. And so that's how we 
calculate stream flow, and then that's what, you know, if you want to look at this stuff on the web, that's what you're looking at. So you're actually looking at a river stage that's been converted into a stream flow value. Now, what's interesting about this is um, generally um, this relationship is stable. So these two things, stage and stream flow, have a nice kind of fixed relationship. But when you throw a bunch of sediment into a river and the bed grades, or if you cut off sediment, like when you have a dam and the river incises, this relationship um, changes. And so we can actually use changes um, in this, the relationship to indicate whether or not the riverbed is changing, whether it's coming up or going down. Um, and so, for example, if normally we go out and we measure 200 CFS in the stream and the river stage should be two and a half feet, but if we go out um, and measure stream flow and it's 200 CFS and the river, is actually, the river stage is actually at three feet, that means, well, the river bed has probably come up. Or if, the, or if we go out and the river is at two feet, that means the river has probably incised in. And so um, this is a tool, because we do have gauges in the basin, and in particular on the Twist River, this is actually a tool that we can use moving forward to start to indicate whether or not we're seeing changes at the places where we gauge the river. Uh, just to give you a sense of how this plays out, I have records, so we, we, use, we use those shifts we can calculate a mean bed change in terms of feet. And that's what these two plots are. So the first one shows Andrews Creek, and then the other one is the Mount River above Goat Creek. Um, so we'll talk about Andrews Creek first. So this plot goes back to probably about 1970 or so. And then this is mean bed change. This is zero, so this would be no change. This is half a foot down, half a foot up, one foot up. And so you notice that like the creek's bouncing along, there's some, some changes, a little bit up and down, but generally the relationship between stage and, and discharge has been stable, and so we, we're pretty confident that the bed hasn't been going up or going down a whole lot. And what's interesting is you come right over here to where the fire was, and now you start to see some really high measurements. So we see the bed changing about a foot, rising up, raising up about a foot. Um, but that only happens during the snow melt season. So the rest of the year, the bed kind of comes back down to where we expected it to be. Um, and so I was talking to another hydrologist in her office about this, and we were kind of trying to come up with some theories about why this might be happening. You know, you could get, during snow melt, you could be getting a bunch of sediment coming off of the banks and bars and even off the hill slopes potentially coming into the channel and filling in some of the pools. Um, and you know, bringing the bed elevation up about a foot. Now what's interesting though is um, when this happens, the bed comes up about a foot, but the water surface elevation of the creek wasn't changing. So that relationship is still stable. So what's happening is the bed's filling in, but it's becoming much smoother. So Andrews Creek has lots of boulders and big cobbles. It's a very rough bed. Water's very turbulent as it flows along. And so what that means is that in order for a certain amount of water to pass through that channel, it, um, it actually has to get pretty deep in order to kind of push over all that stuff. Well, if you put in a bunch of sand and fine sediment and make it real smooth, yeah, the bed has come up, but now the water can move much faster. And so it's actually shallower. Um, the depth of the water is shallower. And so um, that's kind of what we would expect to see in response to wildfire, is, especially on a rough bed, is that yeah, the bed will fill in with sand in places, but it's become smoother, which means the water can flow faster. So you wouldn't necessarily expect to see increased flooding uh, in response. So this, little, this is probably something that folks may not be super familiar with, or, or, or it's a little counterintuitive. So I don't think we have any questions or comments at this point. Um, um, 
I put this other um, plot down here, so it's the same kind of thing, mean bad elevation change. Um, what's interesting is there was a channel, there was an avulsion uh, just downstream of Goat Creek in 2002. And it's, a, it's subtle, but you can kind of see here the, the bed is going up and down a little bit, but it was really right around here where it incised because it basically cut off a, a big meander bend. And so the, the river incised. And then you can see over time, so this is 2002, 2010, you know, up to the present, over time it's kind of been working its way back up. And then it looked like recently there was another um, kind of incision event, and I'm not sure about what's going on there. So um, this is, um, I think this is a good tool because it can give you kind of a heads up of like, okay, are we seeing changes at these, at these sites that might be indicating, you know, sediment either accumulating or, or the washing up. So, so on the, on the Mechow above the Goat Creek, does that imply that the, the speed of the river increased? Um, not necessarily, but probably, yeah. Um, because in that case, you, it wasn't, it wasn't like the bed wasn't necessarily getting finer. Um, and so, um, what you would expect is, yeah, that, that normally the path would have been around a big meander bend, and now it's a shorter path, so it's steeper slope, faster, and then it was able to transport more sediment out of there. Yeah. So. Okay. So, um, just in summary, the effects of wildfire, hydrological effects, they're going to depend on how much of the stream basin burned and its intensity. Generally, you see stream flow increases, but the effects are going to vary seasonally and uh, depending on whether it's a wet year or a dry year. And debris flows are a major uh, risk after wildfire. So I think those are probably the, some of the most important points to take home. We see recovery. Typically over the course of about a decade, as a basin is revegetated, um, but there's still effects that, that might persist. They're just going to be hard to quantify. They'll be hard to, 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 to find them. Not, not to say they're not there, but they're not going to be obvious. And then um, stream, stream gauges provide uh, information about both stream flow and the stream channel. And after a wildfire, we see the sediment with, um, might degrade the stream bed, so it might bring the stream bed up, but it's also going to make the stream bed smoother, so we're not necessarily going to see flood stage uh, uh, increase um, or flooding increase as a response. We could, but you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not certain. Uh, and I just wanted to say if anybody's interested in more information, there's a great book. Um, that was put out by the National Academy of Sciences. It's available free. You can download it as a PDF. Otherwise, it costs about 40 bucks for the paperback version um, from the National Academy Press. So you can go online to National Academy uh, Press. It was published in 2008, and the uh, title is Hydrologic Effects of a Changing Forest Landscape. Uh, so that, that'd be, if, you're, if you want to kind of get some more information, this would be a good, good place to start. Yeah. Um, have any studies been done on similar sized streams or very similar sized drainage basins, but yet where, in one case, the slope is much greater, so that the water when it doesn't come up sort of runs a lot faster compared to one with a more gradual slope down to the stream? I, I don't know of a study that did that kind of like comparison of those two types of basins, but, but there have been a, a number of studies in pretty steep terrain. Uh, there was some early work done in that Antioch in, um, I think it was about 1970. Uh, there was a burn, I want to say 68, I'm not positive about that. And the Forest Service had, um, had some really good um, instrumentation about kind of responses to that. Um, there's been a lot of work in Colorado <laughs> looking at um, responses of uh, like debris flows and flash floods uh, to fire. John Moody is a researcher. Who's um, but you certainly would expect that that has a big effect, um, especially on debris flows, because with the steeper terrain, 
you know, the water is going to be able to uh, pick up and train more sediment, and then, then that material starts moving, and it's much more dense than water, and so that's why debris flows are so catastrophic. So are, are debris flows always channelized in existing stream beds, or can they just... No, I mean, um, let's go back to this picture here. Go. And this is, there was maybe a little gully right there, but you can see, I mean, there's not much of a valley. Right. Um, but typically what you'll see is these debris flows are started, uh, they, they initiate on fairly steep terrain. They might come through a gully, but then as soon as they hit something flatter, they're going to spread out. Um, and, yeah, and, and as I mentioned, you know, they, the, the mechanics of debris flows are very different than water because the water and the sediment mix together and then you have this slurry that's now moving. It's not just water moving, carrying the sediment. It's actually the, the sediment and the water combined. They, it has a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of force, a lot of energy. Yeah? Sounds good. simulations have been done on stream flows around the west, let's just say the west, a lot of it's in the Rocky Mountains, not in the Cascade. But it shows pretty clearly that the timing of runoff is shifting forward. The, the, uh, the runoff is becoming more flashy. What about here? Um, the timing of runoff has shifted forward, but, in, but there's an effect from snowpack. So uh, it's not just warm um, temperatures. You have warm temperatures. You have precipitation falling as rain rather than snow. That um, I haven't seen a good study that has kind of been able to tease those different factors apart. But I think bottom line is that that yeah, we we expect to see more water earlier in the year. 2015 is a great example. So 2015, there was a drought across most of the western U.S. And um, it was a very warm winter, very dry spring, very dry summer. What's interesting is stream flow was higher in a lot of basins in winter uh, because those basins were getting rain. Even though they were getting less rain than they would normally get snow, it was coming as rain, so stream flow was actually higher um, in those basins. I have another question. Yeah, yeah. Um, how much is glacial melt influencing stream flow in the Metcalf? Any? Not much? Uh, not much at all. Yeah. Um, early winters, you know, there's there's uh, a couple of small glaciers on, on Silver Star. Um, <coughs> yeah, that's about it. Tw I don't know a twist, but I don't think there's any. Yeah. Right. So the take home then is say the Twist River, which burned off about 30% or so, which is kind of convenient in terms of yeah. checking your model and, and actually some of those things is different. But uh, if you get an increased sediment delivery, stream beds moves out and your risk of flooding is decreased. Did I hear that correctly? No. So the increased sediment. You expect that the stream bed's going to come up, but it's also going to be smoother. The, you know, the, up by like Newby Creek, I could see that being an a important factor. As you move down the creek, like um, the gauge at Twist, and from, from, from there down to the mouth, I'm not sure that the bed's really that rough. It's cobbly, but it's not bouldery. And so I'm not sure how much um, the sand is going to kind of fill in and smooth the bed. So, um, so there could be, the bed could come up and there could be flooding at lo a lower discharge. So the lower stream flow, you might have water going over bank on the, on the twist. You know, especially if you're seeing more snow accumulation, more snow melt. Um, certainly something to be aware of. 
I'd also probably expect to see big changes down at the confluence, um, which is already a pretty dynamic place. <laughs> and so that'll be interesting to see how that, how that responds, because you know, there'll probably be a lot of sediment coming into the have there, and yeah, things are always shifting around. I expect to be shifting around more. Yeah. So is, is there anybody that you know now for service or USGS or anybody that's uh, setting up some kind of monitoring uh, stations to, to observe what happens with the cliff in spring? Um, I, I do not know. I know USGS, we're not doing anything um, special as far as I know. Um, and I don't know what the Forest Service may or may not be doing. I do know that um, um, there have been efforts to try to set up uh, temporary precipitation um, uh, monitoring stations uh, in wildfire, in areas that have burned, mostly for debris flow warning. Um, and I don't know if there's any plans to do that or, or not. Um, yeah. One thing that um, uh, you can do, if you go online and look at the uh, USGS site for the Twist River, there'll be a real-time hydrograph will show kind of recent stream flow. And if anybody has made a measurement and that measurement is plotting off of the rating curve, it'll be noted on that website. And so that would be an indication of you know, bed elevation changes down at the twist. Yeah, so uh, keep, keep popping into these questions here. So when you, you know, say you have a debris flow, a good size debris flow, and then it indeed blocks a decent sized stream somewhere, um, then what happens? You know, usually um, the, the, a stream will be able to cut through something like that pretty quickly. And mm -hmm. the reason I can say that is because this issue came up on the um, still Wamish, the North Fork of the Still Wamish River after the Ozo landslide. Yeah. And um, there was a kind of an, an impoundment created by that slide, but the river cut through it pretty quickly. And so um, that's, that's kind of what we, what we expect. Okay. Yeah. So when you get more sediment in the Yes. To being rough or yeah, exactly. And that's that's kind of what we think we were seeing in Andrews Creek seasonally. So we see that these pulses of sediment coming through. The little blue dots up here would represent those periods where, where the bed is filling with sediment. And then just over the course of the season, that material gets transported out and we kind of get back to a normal bed elevation. But then kind of each just takes a little while for that material to kind of get moved out by the stream. So when you, when you said that you measure, I forget what the term was, but the, the elevation stage, yep, stage. of the water level, so that's taking into account the elevation of the riverbed, which might be raised, and also the water, are you just measuring the depth of the water, uh, so wherever it is? So when we, so at a stream gauge, we have a device that measures the water, that measures the pressure at a point under the water, but we, so we, we get a measurement of the water surface elevation. So um, the way we get depth is that's when we go out and make a stream flow measurement. Then we're measuring the width of the river, we're measuring its depth, and then we're measuring the velocity of the water. And so then we take the width times the depth and the velocity, and that gives us a stream flow. And so that's where, um, with these, our main bed uh, change, the dots are only when we've gone out and made a measurement, because that's the only time when we actually know what the depth is. You don't is. know if the water is deeper or it's the same depth as the river that is higher. Oh, right. Well, you, well, we have to go out and make a measurement in order to, to determine that. For the regular day, Exactly. Right. Yeah. And so that's that's a key piece of this is that if I show and and that's where like if we saw the the, the stage discharge relationship, this, 
for Andrews Creek, we didn't, we were not seeing big changes here. And that's because even though the bed came up, the water surface isn't higher because the water's moving faster. Yeah. So I'm just kind of wondering, so what is the frequency of the stream beds that are reestablishing their original uh, surface at the bottom? Do they, do, they, do they go below that? It looks like possibly it does from time to time. Yeah. But do they try to seek always what their original structure was in the bottom? That, you know, we, there's, there's that sense. That, I mean, there's a sense that, yeah, that there's some equilibrium elevation that you expect the bed to be. And if all conditions are the same, the river is going to kind of come back to that. But then you have, you know, like an avulsion where the river jumps course and it kind of, things go wonky for a little while, but it, but it kind of worked its way back, you know, and then something else happened. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so depending on, if you, if you look over a short period of time, you expect that there's going to be some equilibrium that the river is going to try to come back to. Over longer periods of time, you could see some big changes. And some systems that are just going to be kind of like cutting down post-glacial um, systems or other places where the valley is essentially filling in. We're doing some work on the Nookstack River, and it appears that there's some places where the valley is just kind of filling in long term. So what's a kind of year to year or month to month communication that goes on be between your office and and say the Forest Service, because you're out in the, you know, you're looking at the same landscape and things can happen. Do you, do you have uh, uh, times when there are conference calls or? Not so much with the Forest Service. We work a lot with the National Weather Service because okay. they're responsible for flood prediction. I see. And so, and they are using our data. Um, and so, um, uh, so we work with them pretty closely, and, and they keep track of things like these the shift in bed elevation. They'll what they'll have to do is they'll have to see evidence that like oh, now the river is going over bank at a certain stream flow. You know, it used to go over bank say at 200 cfs, and now it's going over bank at 150. They'll change the flood level, the like that uh, action level where they start to say oh. Minor flooding is expected, um, but that doesn't happen instantaneously. And, yeah, and that's where you know we can get some indication that that might be happening um, by kind of digging into the stream gauge information. But you know, but again, I don't want to be alarmist at all. Like for Andrews Creek, we are seeing at most kind of a foot. Um, Change and as I mentioned, that that was not that's in the bed that wasn't in, in flood stage, and that was a that was a very intense fire in the entire basin burn, um, and so I would expect that that's um, you know a bigger effect than we would see in most other places. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yes. This is, this is fun. Yes.